Well, it was uh, it was an uh, ordinary Tuesday morning as far as we were concerned. Uh, the 121st Fighter Squadron, of which I was a part, we had just participated in a red flag deployment for the previous two weeks and had returned back home uh, that early, you know, it's Saturday. So the commanders had given the vast majority of the full-time force, which really was not that uh, many folks at that point in time, uh, a pass for Tuesday to be able to reconnect, or for Monday to be able to reconnect with their families. So Tuesday was really the first time that we were kind of getting back to work. All of our traditionals who had been deployed to Red Flag were back off doing their normal civilian jobs. And so we were just kind of settling back into the groove and um, planning out the week. So that morning on Tuesday was really just an average morning, uh, getting up, eating my Cheerios, uh, driving into work. It was really just very normal. I was in the middle of a long-range scheduling meeting with the other five full-timers uh, there at the fighter squadron. So um, we were planning out the week and really planning out the month as well, looking at what our training priorities would be, our check ride priorities, looking at our range times, transitioning the jets into a new phase of training and a new phase of flight. And so we were working just through a lot of the administration details of getting back into our training rhythm uh, when a knock came at the door and uh, an enlisted person you know, opened up the door and poked their head in and said, hey, somebody flew into the World Trade Center. And we all looked at each other. We looked outside the windows. And as everyone remembers in Washington, D.C., it was a crystal in September morning. I mean, just blue skies, uh, very clear day. It was lovely. And we all kind of looked at each other really puzzled because normally the weather, the weather patterns in D.C. are not that different from what they are in uh, New York. And we all kind of laughed. We're like, wow, what kind of bozo really porked his instrument approach? Uh, you know, going into New York. We thought it was just, you know, some small airplanes, maybe a general aviation, that had really just made a terrible mistake coming down the Hudson River. And so we laughed a little bit about it because we had no concept of the magnitude of what had actually occurred. And we really didn't understand that it wasn't, you know, a Cessna 172, which realistically um, would probably dent the building, I mean, hardly cause any kind of damage, as opposed to, in reality, what it truly was. So we did not understand. After we got the first word, we went back to our meeting. We continued to discuss uh, and uh, plan out the week and the flying schedule uh, as normal, because we did not understand or have any way to comprehend. I mean, there was no further information regarding how serious the situation was. And so it wasn't until the second aircraft struck the second World Trade Center that when, you know, our listening folks came in and they said, hey, a second airplane hit the World Trade Center, it was on purpose. Then, I mean, the meeting obviously immediately dissolved and we all rushed to go actually see what was being reported on, uh, on the media and go look at the television. And that was when I think all of us really understood at a visceral level uh, that the world had changed. I was a brand new first lieutenant. Um, I had just gotten to the fighter squadron in January of 2001. So um, I was the training officer. I was in charge of managing and tracking the, uh, the combat training that we do. It's continuation training for uh, all of our fighter pilots to ensure that we're ready and qualified in all the different events that we need to be able to do, whether or not that's uh, air-to-air -air dog fighting, air-to-air -air intercepts, uh, missile shoots, bombing, things like that. That was my job to manage and ensure that everyone was qualified to do that. So that was part of what we were doing during that scheduling training meeting. I was also a brand new wingman, uh, having just graduated from the F-16 basic course. And so I was still um, a young fighter pilot learning my trade. The DC Air National Guard, the fighter side, the 121st Fighter Squadron, is on the east side of the base, which is really only about eight nautical miles as the crow flies from the Pentagon. There was, uh, initially there was a lot of confusion because if, if you can remember, you know, 10 years ago, uh, there was really, there were no real um, air defense uh, units. Uh, the, the air defense units, which had been stood up and had used to populate the whole United, the continental United States to defend um, our sovereign soil from the Soviet bear, 
when the Soviet Union collapsed, that had been drawn down significantly throughout the 90s. So my unit, which once upon a time um, with F-105s used to sit alert, uh, an air sovereignty mission for NORAD and First Air Force, no longer was part of that air defense mission. We were a general purpose unit designed to go to war, not necessarily to protect American soil. And so as a result, our chain of command didn't go up to NORAD, didn't go up through the First Air Force. So when, uh, when the first aircraft hit the trade centers and it was clear to NORAD and First Air Force that they needed to defend America's skies, they had no method to be able to reach down or, or even really to know that the D.C. Air National Guard was there in D.C. and was available. There was no clear authority to be able to reach down to us. So just as they couldn't reach down to us, we ha had no way to be able to reach up into them to get authorization to go fly. So there was a lot of confusion. As, as a young wingman, I mean, really kind of the most that I could do was stand there and be ready to be tasked. As I watched my leadership um, in a very creative and ad hoc way, try to reach up through their uh, chain of command to be able to get authority to launch. There was no, because that was not one of our uh, doctrinal taskings, there was no alert training for me as a wingman. My job was to learn how to go to war. My job wasn't learn how to um, sit alert. And there were no rules of engagement. Um, we hadn't, I hadn't even thought about, you know, what, um, what that kind of mission might be like on American soil. Defensive counter air, which is probably the closest um, that I had trained to, is typically something that's planned for. It's in the air tasking order. It's something that we might do to, to protect a base overseas, but it really wasn't something that we had thought about regarding having to do um, on the good old U.S. And I had also never been trained to, how do I scramble the aircraft? So I had never done a scramble start, which is, to give you a little bit of perspective, when you start an F-16, especially before we had GPS on the aircraft, and at that time we did not have GPS, um, we had inertial navigation units, INUs, which took at least eight minutes to be able to just get the gyroscopes spinning to be able to give us a navigational platform. So it would typically take about 20 minutes to start the jet, get the avionics and the systems going, go through all the pre-flight checks uh, to ensure that all the systems were operating properly, program the computers in the aircraft, and that's not even including the time to look at the forms and do the walk around of the airplane and whatnot. So we usually planned about half an hour to 40 minutes from the time you walked out the door to the time that you actually took off. And as a new guy, I was very concerned. I mean, it, I was going to do everything right, and I was going to do everything by the book because attention to detail and ensuring that you execute perfectly is part of a fighter pilot creed, and that was what I was, you know, learning to do. So what was demanded of us that morning was completely, um, you know, seat of the pants as far as I was concerned. Um, a scramble start is uh, where, and it, it specifically towards how we execute the mission now, a scramble start is where once you, uh, once the horn goes off, you can run to the jet, start it expeditiously, and be able to get airborne within a minimum set of minutes, and that's in single digits, not even double digits. So it's a very um, quick reaction to some kind of external threat so that you have time to be able to get airborne and be able to turn that threat around before it gets towards whatever, uh, whatever you're trying to protect. When it was clear that there was a that there was a threat to, uh, to the DC area, which we immediately assumed once that second aircraft um, had hit uh, the World Trade Center, because Washington, DC is the heart of, of the United States. It's, it's the nation's capital. It's the center of the free, free world. So um, as, as ominous as those two aircraft hitting the World Trade Center were, uh, it was very clear to us that it was we needed to get airborne to be able to protect Washington, D.C.
As I mentioned before, the challenge for us was how did we get authorization to be able to get airborne? Uh, National Guard units have two separate chains of command. We have a federal chain of command, but in order for that federal chain of command, which then uh, mobilizes us into the active duty Air Force and then there are specific um, uh, lines that go up uh, through the active duty Air Forces to the Secretary of Defense and to the President, you have to be mobilized to make that happen. Our other chain of command, which is the standing chain of command, is the, um, is the state chain of command, is the civilian. So we go up through the governor. Well, um, the D.C. Air National Guard uh, doesn't go to the mayor of Washington, D.C. It actually goes up through the secretary of the army and ultimately to the president of the United States. So we were having to work our civilian chain of command to um, activate that to try and get permission to become airborne. As a young wingman, my job was to, uh, I mean, I, like I said, I was standing around waiting for someone to basically tell me what to do um, so that I could support what we were trying to, to be able to get airborne. So what I basically did was I took our, um, we had data transfer cartridges for the F-16, and it, think of it like a very large floppy disk or a very large thumb drive because there are so many computerized avionics on the aircraft, whether or not that's uh, weapons information, um, navigational information, et cetera, that we, that we are able to program before we ever get to the aircraft. So we can take this data cartridge and then plug it into the jet and turn it on and download how the mission profile, all of that navigation um, information, et cetera. So what I was doing while my leadership was trying to, to, to energize the chain of command upward to get authorization to, to launch, I was programming, um, basically programming the jet, so I was programming the data transfer cartridges. And uh, it was just based off of, you know, where, what's, what's in the D.C. area? Um, where's the Capitol? Uh, where's the National Mall? Um, are there critical infrastructure? Um, where are all the little airports? Things like that. Um, I was focused on expeditiously, expeditiously loading up those cartridges and then trying to free myself up so that I could then um, do whatever the next thing necessary was. It's, this doesn't, this sounds counterintuitive, but when I re, when the magnitude of the situation hit me, uh, I really lost all emotion. I didn't have an emotional reaction at all. It was really much more focused on what are the things that I need to do to enable us to protect our capital? What are the things that I need to do um, to facilitate us getting airborne. Uh, the most time that I had for reflection was, you know, when I finished uploading up the data transfer card to the DTCs, uh, standing at the ops counter and observing what leadership was doing and trying to anticipate what the next step might be so that I could be of more use. So we had um, Lieutenant Colonel Phil Thompson, dog, uh, took over duties as a supervisor of flying previously. Um, uh, uh, Dan Kane Raisin, who was our weapons officer, had been acting as a supervisor of flying. Uh, but Dog took over to free Raisin, because he was also our weapons officer, to free Raisin up so that he could um, begin to manage and prepare for uh, what, we, you know, what we anticipated, the being able to get airborne. Um, our wing commander, uh, General Worley, uh, came down and was standing there at the ops desk trying to get information. Um, again, trying to energize the chain of command. One thing that was very special and unique about, our, again, our situation being there at Andrews is that because Andrews is also the home of Air Force One, we had established a relationship with the Secret Service in the air traffic control tower because when Air Force One moves, the Secret Service owns the airfield so that they can provide better protection for the president. So we had established a relationship with them um, in order to be able to manage the impact to our daily flying activities. And so one of the things that was going on was that uh, uh, Dan Kane called the Secret Service, called the guys in the tower, folks that he knew through a personal relationship to say, hey, we're here. 
we can help have someone tell us what to do and having General Worley begin to address that relationship as well. Um, also, you know, uh, in flying with the phase and the training that we're in, when we train, we don't train with, you know, real bombs that have explosives on, on them. As a matter of fact, the, 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 we either train with no weapons on board and we are able to simulate uh, the, the actual weapons employment or we train with, you know, very small concrete uh, projectiles which, you know, um, can mimic the actual um, fall profile of real weapons. So we realistically had nothing that we would be able to um, do if we got, we would, we would take air, we would take off unarmed. So the other thing that uh, we did, which was very out of the box, but realizing the seriousness of the situation, uh, Raisin called down to the bomb dump, which is, you know, located far away from any population on the base because that's where the things that go boom live, right? So if something happens, you want that very isolated. And so the guys that live down there, they got no television, they got no radio. I mean, they're living in a world where to them it's just another beautiful blue Tuesday morning. And then they get this phone call, says, hey, I want you to uh, build up some real AIM-9 heat-seeking missiles. Well, what are you talking about? Trust me, do it. Um, so he, so Raisin was energizing what he knew by anticipating what we would need to do, but that was going to take some time. Uh, sickened that we weren't airborne first. And it, it simply um, increased the sense of urgency to the situation. We had had um, we had had three air aircraft airborne earlier that morning uh, for a training mission down um, at Dare County, which is in North Carolina. And it was just a very basic um, uh, bombing mission, basic surface attack. They were going to do some strafing with bullets as well. And uh, one guy had uh, gotten down to his, uh, what we call bingo gas. It's a, it's a fuel where, you, okay, whatever you're doing, you need to just come home because that's going to give you enough, that's going to be the fuel you need to be able to get home. So he had been returning on his own and when uh, the towers were hit. And because he was coming back home and air traffic control knew that he was an F-16, he was getting some very unusual queries from air traffic. Hey, do you, get, do, you have any, do you have any missiles on board? Do you have any bombs on board? So he called back to um, the ops desk where we were all standing around and talked to Doug Thompson who had taken over the supervisor of flying duties. And uh, hey, you know, what are, what are they, what's going on? Don't worry about it. Just come home. How much gas do you got? All right, just come home and land. So that was, uh, that was Puck Hagenson and, and Puck came in and, and he landed. And then the two other guys that were still down at the range, Dog called the range control officer and said, I need you to send these guys home and tell them to buster, which means come home as fast as they possibly can. So they were coming home as quickly as possible. And again, they were also getting queried by ATC, air traffic control. So when they landed, um, Dog asked him, you know, hey, how much, how much gas do you guys have? And, and one of them, uh, Billy Hutchison, had just enough gas to be able to take off because they knew based off of, uh, air traffic control knew based off of the radar signals that they had and the transponder signals that they anticipated that there was another aircraft uh, inbound, that's Flight 93 obviously, retrospectively. So Dog told them, take off and look down the river. They think that there's another one coming off down the river. So Billy took off and he did a sweep to the south and he did a sweep to the north um, the, down the Potomac and then he landed. And when he was taking off again was when um, Sass and I were, got, we were taxiing to get airborne. There was uh, four of us, plan once we finally got word, um, or actually uh, four of us, it was uh, um, Mark Sassaville, myself, we were paired up as a two ship, then Raisin Kane and a fellow named um, Brandon Rasmussen was going to be the second two ship. And we had a very quick uh, uh, briefing regarding, you know, sort of take off, where are we going to go, how do we stay together, just some of the, the bread and butter of how we would essentially um, operate. But it was decided that Sass and I would take off first, even though we knew that we would end up having to take off before 
our aircraft were armed. Yes, Sass and I would take off. And then um, Brazen and Igor would wait until they got AIM-9 heat-seeking missiles um, on board the aircraft. And when they had, when they had um, AIM-9s, then they, then they would take off. So Sass and I would take off first, and they would wait however long they needed to until they got AIM-9s. And uh, it, was, it was clear that, as you said, we would take the aircraft down. We wouldn't be shooting it down. We would be um, ramming the aircraft because we didn't have weapons on board to be able to shoot the airplane down. Uh, between both SAS and I had 105 bullets lead-nosed. They were not high incendiary explosives. Um, and so as we were putting on our flight gear uh, in the life support shop, Sass looked at me and said, I'll ram the cockpit. And uh, I had made the decision that I would take the tail off the aircraft because um, if you ran the cockpit, the debris field of the aircraft, I mean, it would still be moving forward, so it would be a, a forward and fanned wide debris field. But I knew that if I took off the tail of the aircraft, um, that it would essentially go straight down, and so that the pattern of debris would be minimized. The, I mean, the, the people on Flight 93 were heroes, but they were going to die no matter what. And so my concern was, how do I minimize collateral damage on the ground? And how do I keep it from going forward, depending on where we might intercept the aircraft? We took off, and we knew that there was one coming down the river. So, um, I mean, <laughs> we, we, we ran down the, the sidewalk, and we jumped in the aircraft, and. Um, you know, it was funny because, again, like I said, I was, I was a new guy, and I, I was trying to do everything by the book, right? And this was so not by the book. We were improvising everything and making it up on the go based off of our, our experience and knowledge of tactics of, of you know, um, weapon, weaponry and, and flying the aircraft and just what information we'd been able to gather from the situation. But, you know, so I, I got down to my airplane, and... and my first instinct was to look at the forms, and Sass looked at me and goes, Lucky, what are you doing? Get in the airplane. Get it started. So we jumped up in the airplane and got the airplane started, and completely, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't go through any of the normal checks. It was just the bare bones to make sure this airplane was safe, to make sure that it was flyable. But I, I mean, I distinctly remember uh, SAS taxi, and I mean, I just got my radios up, and I'm yelling at my crew chief, you know, pull the chocks, pull the chocks, and he pulls the chocks, and I push, you know, I push forward the throttle, and my crew chief and the other, you know, other guys in the flight line are still running underneath the airplane as they're pulling pins out of the aircraft um, so that I can, you know, so that my gear will come up, so that, you know, uh, uh, there, there are safety pins that are all in, the air, all in the airplane. And so they're pulling all those safety pins as I'm taxiing um, to go do an immediate takeoff. I didn't, I didn't even have an inertial navigation unit. I did not have any of that, that up. So this was, in many ways, it was fortunate that it was a clear blue day because we were essentially VFR, um, uh, visual flight rules. I mean, we didn't have the, all of the avionics uh, were not yet uh, awake when we took off. You know, to be honest, I don't know. I think it was sometime after 10.30. It wasn't so much that I kept my emotions in check. It was just that they didn't even exist. They just weren't even there. But um, there was significant adrenaline. And it was really just, you know, um, dear God, please don't let me screw up. <laughs> Well, we, we took off, and I was, you know, it was a, it was a, it, we taxied out, um, got clearance to take off before we even got to the runway. SAS took off. It was a ruling takeoff. I followed right after him, um, and I re rejoined to a, you know, a loose route, and then we went out to, to tactical, and we just headed 
uh, to the northwest. We were talking with Potomac, and Potomac was giving us vectors for where they thought or anticipated where the threat might be. So we were looking on our radars, you know, trying to dig out, did we get any low returns? Yeah. It was surreal. It was totally surreal to see just the billowing black smoke. And we did not, I mean, when we took off, we didn't get high. I mean, we stayed, you know, 3,000 feet. So we were, you know, we were smoking over the city uh, at, at, at very low altitude. We never got above 3,000 feet, at least not on that first uh, sweep out, because we needed to make sure that we, you know, stayed low for a visual lookout um, as well as, as for the radars. No, not at that point in time. I and mean, we knew what our mission was, and and we that that was that was a singular focus was the communication between me and SAS to ensure that, you know, th that we had a comprehensive sweep of the airspace so that nothing got by us and that we were also um, visually looking out to see whether or not there was a another airliner. And then we got, um, we actually flew, I, I don't remember how many nautical miles away we got from D.C., but we flew quite a bit down the Potomac and spread out for because the further the further away we got from D.C., the further we spread out a little bit because it, maybe he might have changed the axis of, of where he was coming in, maybe he wanted to be a little bit sneakier. But we got a, to a point where he said, you know what, we need, to, we need to ranch house, which means go back home. We need to go back and fly over D.C. because we've, we've, we've clearly sanitized the area and ensured that he's not an immediate threat, that, that the aircraft, Flight 93, is not in the, the near vicinity and able to prosecute an attack at that point in time. So we need to get back and make sure that we can play the short goalie game now um, that we cleared out the airspace. And so when we returned back to D.C., um, that was when things began to, I mean, on one hand settle down because we never, you know, Flight 93 wasn't there. Um, and as we discovered, you know, as we discovered later, the, the passengers on that flight were, were truly heroes. Um, but then we had to get into the business of making sure that all the aircraft got on the ground because there were many small general aviation or, or small commercial um, uh, business aircraft or whatnot that hadn't gotten word that the FAA grounded everybody. And so um, there was still a lot of uh, aviation going on there where we had to uh, sanitize the airspace, and of course there were also um, a tremendous number of first responders. So we needed to work with Potomac to be able to make sure that anyone who was near the national capital region was somebody who was supposed to be airborne, and if they weren't, then we were going to turn them away. For, for the larger aircraft, again, it would simply be um, taking off the tail, which would be, you know, I would essentially be a kamikaze and ram my aircraft into the tail of the of the aircraft and you know I gave some thought to you know what I what I have time to eject but I would need to ensure that I mean you only got one chance I mean you don't want to eject and then have missed right I mean you got to be able to stick with it the whole way when we came back and we continued to do the combat air patrol over D.C., and there were plenty of other aircraft airborne that we did actually have to turn away, um, what we finally, what we employed was we, we would thump them. I mean, we would, we would fly in front of them and uh, uh, put out a flare or two. A flare is a, well, I mean, you know what a flare is. Uh, and so we'd, we'd pump out a flare out of the aircraft uh, and basically turn those other aircraft away. And we would also get on the, uh, the Victor frequency, um, it's called guard, and then try to communicate with the aircraft. Uh, that way it's a 121.5 is a frequency that all pilots know about, and it's sort of a, it's called guard. It's universal if you get in trouble or you need help or you don't, you know, you're not on the same frequency. If you go over to the guard frequency, then you should be able to talk to anybody. So we would also try to get them up on guard, of course. We got word um, 
not specifically that it had crashed, but that it was, I mean, it was no longer a threat. Probably, I mean, my recollection on this is relatively fuzzy, but maybe uh, an hour or so um, after we had gotten airborne. What had happened was then uh, Raisin and Igor uh, got their AIM 9s on the jets and then they took off. And um, as we were airborne, then uh, Mark Sasseville and Dan Kane, uh, Sass and Raisin, worked with uh, the Potomac Air Traffic Controllers. And this was actually a true, uh, just a, such a testament to the professionalism and uh, abilities of the air traffic controllers there in Potomac because their job is to keep airplanes separated and keep them on um, routes which are kind of like roads in the sky, you know, and sequence them a certain minute, miles or minutes apart from each other. And in less than five minutes, they learned how to speak a uh, military fighter pilot to us um, as if they were a, a combat controller because. Um, Sass and Raisin said, all right, so there's a navigation aid on um, Washington Reagan Airfield. It's called a Vortac. So take this Vortac, and there are, if you can imagine, 360 radials coming out of it. It's one of the ways that we navigate. So you take those radials, and then you take a mileage off of that radial. So for example, um, instead of calling the, uh, the Washington Reagan Vortac National, let's just call it Bullseye, all right? follow me on this, just call it bullseye. And then if there's somebody who might be on the 090 radial of that Vortac, you would call that bullseye 090. And if he was 30 miles away, you would call it 090 for 30. And then give me an altitude cut, 090 for 30, 5,000 feet. And instantaneously, these guys got it. Their learning agility was phenomenal. And they adapted and changed how they had been trained to operate um, in sequencing airplanes and separating them to then learning how to bring airplanes together and affect an intercept and help give us a vector to um, go intercept somebody that they might see. Or for example, if we had a radar uh, hit on an entity out there, we would say, hey, I, you know, I, uh, declare contact bullseye 030 for 25, 2,000 feet. And Potomac would then say, Oh, well, that's uh, Medevac flight 1363. He's squawking uh, 5263, um, and he's off of uh, Fredericksburg, and he's headed towards Easton or something like that. And so they were very quickly able to start speaking military speak. And then because we were now talking the same language, we could, we could then discern and differentiate between who was a first responder, who was supposed to be airborne, who was helping the good guys, and who were those unknowns out there that either they were just sort of bumbling around because they didn't get the news, um, and so they were sort of just unintentionally airborne because they didn't know any better, and who was potentially a threat. So the first responders, we would let them go on their way, and anyone else we would go check out. About four hours later, um, NORAD had started their response through First Air Force. So folks down at Langley uh, took off, but they were vectored over the Atlantic Ocean because they thought, well, there might be more flights coming inbound um, over the Atlantic. So they went out over the Atlantic, and they were high. They were above 18,000 feet. Um, and NORAD had also uh, scrambled some tankers. And so then there were tankers that were out over the Atlantic as well. So when um, those guys then came in, they were called the, the Quints. When the Quints then came in over DCA, uh, NEADS, which is the Northeast Air Defense Sector, uh, which then can, is part of NORAD, but NEADS is that regional control, they called the Potomac and said, hey, we got the Quints uh, airborne. We need to talk to the guys that you have over DC. So then uh, we began working with the Quints, and then they had um, uh, air refueling capability over the Atlantic. And so then that's what enabled us to stay airborne for four hours. And we put the Quints in a high cap to look to see if was there anyone. Because the higher you are, the further out that you can see with your radar. So they, were, they had the high look, and they were specifically looking out over the Atlantic. And then we had um, basically an X cap where um, I had the uh, northeast uh, leg, 
Sass had the northwest leg, Raisin had the southwest leg, and then Igor had the southeast leg. And so then we were clearing and um, basically pushing down all the unknown aircraft and keeping them away from DC. I landed, went to the bathroom, sent an email to my parents to let them know that I was alive, and then was rounded up by um, Colonel Mark Doherty because there was uh, National Guard leadership that wanted to know about what did we see, what did we do, kind of begin to fill their situational awareness with what we had done that morning. So Sass and I got scooped up and taken to the readiness center um, to go brief uh, a number of general officers who were trying to um, gather information and then continue to respond uh, to be able to protect our nation. It, they were really just very focused on, you know, what did you see? Um, and it was kind of a, what's the state of the, of the cap at that point in time? So uh, it, they just want to know, so what's going on with, uh, with, the, with the X cap that we had put up? Uh, Sass mentioned, you know, and told them about the tanker and told them about um, the quints that were uh, in, in the high look. And it, there was just, it was really basic information, and there wasn't, there wasn't anything really earth-shattering about what we were able to, to tell them. But when we walked out, I mean, because it was a really unusual day. And then we got, you know, we, we had another, um, we needed to get airborne again. We were low on people and the base had shut down. So they really weren't letting anyone on base and they weren't really letting anyone off base. So we didn't have that many pilots that, that we could fly. So it was a very quick turn for us. I mean, I don't think that we were on the ground for more than an hour. I was starting to, the adrenaline was draining away because after the, you know, after the initial, after the initial intercept or, or attempted to take off and, and uh, sweep of the Northwest, we, I had brought down a lot of um, little general aviation aircraft, turning them away, getting them to land. And that had become somewhat routine. So it wasn't as, we weren't getting complacent but the immediate threat had gone down. And this time I was taking off with um, a full load of bullets and AIM-9s. Uh, the AIM-9s are the, the heat seeker missiles. So I, I actually had missiles on board this time. No. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, when I took off that day, we didn't know what would happen. We fully, Sass and I fully expected to, to intercept Flight 93 and to take it down. So the experience of the moment is very different from the reflective experience. Um, because reflecting on it 10 years from now, I didn't change history. Um, I didn't keep the, I, I didn't keep the Pentagon from, from being hit. Um, so it, the, 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 the experience of the moment and did we actually change the course of events were, were kind of two different things. So um, how, you, um, how you resolve those uh, is, I don't know that you, that you really do. A couple weeks later, when we had gotten into the routine of the combat air patrols and whatnot, uh, our um, ops group commander, um, Jeff Johnson, who is now our wing commander, just a tremendous, uh, tremendous man, had gone to the Pentagon for some briefings of what the DC Guard had done because um, it was really unprecedented from from September 11th from 9/11 for the next I think it was three weeks the DC Air National Guard owned and controlled the cap the combat air patrol so when fighters flew in from Langley or from ever, anywhere else 
we actually owned and we were the cap commanders. So we would then commit fighters that were in, in the cap to go intercept or investigate uh, if somebody else um, came in, which was a very unusual control structure. Um, so he had gone to the Pentagon as, as part of the, the lessons learned and the hot wash, which because, as you remember at the time, it was, how could this happen? And so there was intense um, analysis and study of what, what were the failures that led up to that point and what was our response and how did we learn? And he came back and he gathered all of us into the, uh, the mission briefing room and, and told us a story of what someone had said to him when he was... Um, when he was walking through the Pentagon, because they saw him and they saw his flight suit and saw his patches and started asking, oh, so you're from the D.C. Guard. And they had been in the Pentagon when it was hit. And so they had been, this, you know, this individual had been part of the evacuation out of the Pentagon. And for the folks that were, you know, coming out of the east side, I mean, they still had a child development center there. and. The women were handing out babies because they couldn't carry enough babies um, out of the out of the child development center, and so they were just trying to you know to ev to evacuate these kids. You can imagine. I mean, I'm a mother now myself, and so to imagine um, what that must have been like, you know, as you're seeing these Pentagon you know workers and 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 service members, uh, you know, rushing out of the Pentagon and trying to get these children safe to a place of safety. And the acrid smoke was billowing up, and I mean, I, the smell of the jet fuel and uh, all the burning debris and the burning flesh and the ashes falling falling down, and nobody knew. There was there was no information for those individuals as they were evacuating the building. Was there another one coming in? I mean, there had been two that had hit uh, the World Trade Center, and then. We flew over in full afterburner, coming low, right over the Pentagon as we headed up north to look for Flight 93. And this individual said that the entire crowd erupted into cheers because they knew at that point in time that they were safe because we were airborne and we wouldn't let anyone else come and hurt them. On that day, I, you know, I went up for a second one and. Um, escorted the president back in on Air Force One. And that was, you know, that, that second mission was very interesting because that was when we were um, a given authority for free fire. So that as, you know, typically for the rules of engagement, um, there, it's very, very strict. We are very deliberate about who has the authority to authorize whether or not you hit the pickle button and a missile comes off the jet. And in a free fire zone, that decision lays with the pilot. So that came, uh, that authorization came out uh, during the second, second sortie and lasted for some time thereafter. And I truly believe that it's a testament to the professionalism um, of the fighter pilots who manned the combat air patrol over DC that no one was pickle happy, if you will. I mean, I think we all understood how serious that charge was um, and what that kind of responsibility was. Not only the charge to protect the national capital region, to protect the capital of the free world, but also um, the consequences if you didn't make the right call. So I really, you know, it, it gives me tremendous faith in the quality of our servicemen from the combat controllers to the guys on the ground to the fighter pilots and the, the, the war fighters who are actually doing the deed. It gives me tremendous faith in their level of training and professionalism that no mistakes were made. The president is constantly um, escorted, um, and Air Force One is is 
there's always a level of safety now the 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 types of of escort and whatnot that's you know um that's up to the secret service and that's part of the uh part of their plan it was unusual for us though um, because that's not a, a typical mission that that we had well we had never done anything like that before um, so it was it was fairly unusual but to be honest that was anticlimactic compared to what had been asked of us during the first mission because we had spent you know sufficient amount of time during the for the the course of my first sortie and then guys had taken off after me so by the time that that evening sortie um, came around things were fairly quiet everyone was on the ground except for the first uh, responders um, so it really wasn't really wasn't that busy when we were given the call um, on my way home actually no it was after I got home well my mother was really emotional uh, my dad um, he's an old fighter pilot so you know he was asking more specific questions but they were both just glad that I was okay um, I think I probably got home sometime after 11 p.m. Um, and I just just fell into bed well the first time that uh, I went to Iraq was uh, in 2003 as part of the um, initial operations of uh, Iraqi freedom and uh, we were part of the 410th uh, expeditionary wing and we were scud hunters we operated in the in western Iraq in the western desert specifically to deter and suppress scuds that may hit our um, coalition partners or might be aimed towards Israel we also supported uh, special operations forces who were doing movements uh, throughout western Iraq Well, these, uh, these obviously are, are my very personal opinions. Um, as, as a member of our, of our military, I truly believe that there are some things that are more important than me, which is why I'm willing to, if necessary, uh, sacrifice myself for the things that we believe in as Americans, our Constitution, freedom, democracy, our rights, our way of life. And I know that there's a certain amount of risk that's inherent in that, not necessarily as being a, you know, as being a service member, but democracy is necessarily open that is one of the cultural values that we have and I often wonder if if we have forsaken some of what it means to be American some of what it means to be America in our response to try to assure our citizens of security there's no such thing as perfect security I mean uh, like I said I've got little girls and there's a line in Finding Nemo you know well if, if you never let anything happen to them then nothing's ever gonna happen to them I mean so I mean that's a kind of a, a cute way to to say that if we're going to be America and everything that America stands for we can't, as citizens, expect our, our, our government to provide 100% security. Now, I do believe that there are smart things that the government should do to mitigate risk and is important for our national interests. Um, but have we been overzealous and have we gone, has the pendulum swung too far such that we are abdicating our value set in terms of what does it mean to be American um, and our desire to be totally safe. 
The America that I know and that I believe in is resilient, is courageous, is strong, and can rebuild. And we saw that spirit after 9-11. But we also saw, I think, a desire in, in, from individuals, from, from people, to want to be assured of perfect security, to know that they're going to be completely safe, and that they were willing to give up some of those rights, some of those freedoms, that openness, so that they could be perfectly secure and perfectly safe. And that isn't the courageous, resilient America that I know. And so as I think back to 9-11 and what it means to me personally and, and how things have changed over the last decade and what's the America that I want my daughters to grow up in, what's the kind of American that I want them to be, I believe there's something special about us. I believe that there's that America truly is the greatest nation on earth. And I want them to have an open-hearted pride in that and that they're not afraid and that they will refuse to be cowed. And I understand there's some risk involved in that. And I'm not advocating that we be foolish and and accept unnecessary risk. But my father and my grandfather, my mother and my grandmother, part of the greatest generations. And I think we are too. And we should act like it. And I'll say that I was there. It's, uh, and if they, you know, if they're at the age and, and it's appropriate to talk more in depth regarding what my personal experience was. I think it's also important to talk about, I mean, you know, obviously it wasn't just about me and what I did in, in my aircraft. I mean, there, the, the tremendous response of the firefighters and the policemen um, and just strangers helping strangers in New York and here um, in D.C. I would want to use my story as a gateway to help them think about what everyone else went through on that day.